This video is uh, a continuation from the Riemann sums and definite integrals video. Um, I'm just going to present another example and then also some, some other properties that are listed in 4.3 that have to do with uh, definite integration. So here's our general formula we're going to be using. And if you can recall from the last video, I, uh, I distinguished between the area and the integral. So as you can see in this one, it says find the area of the region bounded by f of x, the x-axis, and bound by x equals 1 and x equals 2. So what we'll be finding the area of is from 1 to 2, and it's all going to be above the x-axis. So um, in this case, the integral is going to be representative of the area as well, because we're not going to have any negative values that we have to take into account. <coughs> so if we look to what we can plug into our formula, first thing we do is look to see where the uh, where the interval that we're finding the area of starts it does not start at zero so we have to compensate for that it starts at one so that means that um, what we'll be uh, plugging back into the original function is going to be one plus and then I guess it would help to find our change of x um, in this case, 2 is our B and 1 is our A. B is always the rightmost and A is always the leftmost. So B minus A over N and our change of X equals 1 over N. So now we can put that in right here. So it's going to be 1 plus I over N times our change of X, which is 1 over N. Um, this one came from the fact that we did not start at zero, so we've got to take into account that we're, we're starting ahead already. So, um, remember that this is an x value right here. So this is, this is the x value of the first, uh, rectangle that we're using. So imagine that there is a rectangle right here. Um, that's not back here at zero because that rectangle, if it was at zero, that rectangle would be all the way over here. But um, in order to get the rectangle we want, we're just going to do one plus and then that first one. And then i over n, you just multiply i by your change of x and then change of x, you just plug it in right there. So the limit as n approaches infinity, i equals one. We're going to I'm gonna plug this back into our original f of x. And after some distributive property and simplifying, uh I'm gonna skip those ones, but what you end up getting is three minus two i over n minus i squared over n squared and that's multiplied by your 1 over n. This I just um, plug this in right here for x and then did a bunch of distributive property and combining like terms. We can pull this one out to the front just so uh, we don't have to worry about it getting in our way at all and then I'll put brackets around it times so now we've got our summation 
i equals 1 of 3 minus 2i over n minus i squared over n squared. Um, when you're when you have the summation of something with uh, more than one term, you can split it up. So that's going to that's going to be n i equals one three minus summation n i equals one. I'm going to pull the 2n out of here just so I can get the i by itself. So 2 over n times i minus summation n i equals 1. I'm going to pull out a 1 over n squared to isolate the i squared. Close our brackets. And then do some uh, use some summation properties, which I still have the paper for. Just as a refresher, here's the summation formulas. And so we're going to be using those. Um, this first one, uh, when you have the summation with n on the top and a constant as your function, you just do the constant times n minus, we're going to have 2n because really you could just bring this out in the front right there. And then when you've got the summation of i, that comes out to be n times n plus 1 over 2 minus, and then like we did with this one, you can bring this one out into the front right there. And so we have 1 over n squared times from those summation formulas, I'll just show them one more time, uh, i squared, i squared is going to be this formula right here, and notice how that, these also get rid of that summation sign when you do the substitution. So i squared is n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all divided by 6. So you get that, and after a whole lot of distribution, um, after a whole lot of uh, distribution and simplifying uh, these things down, um, I don't want to do it in this video because I've still got to cover some extra properties. Uh, so hopefully, um, just take your time with uh, your distributing and look for things that can cancel. And so once you get all of this simplified down, you come out with something like 3 minus the quantity 1 plus 1 over n minus 1 third plus 2, oops, plus 1 over 2n plus 1 over 6n squared. Uh, this 3 corresponds to right here, this part corresponds to this part, and this last section corresponds to this last section, if you just wanted to check it step by step.
Um, if you take, can get rid of this limit sign now because we're going to start taking the limit right here. So as n approaches infinity, let's see, the first one we get to is right here. If n approaches infinity right there, we get 1 over infinity, and that just equals 0. So uh, this, this part right here is just going to equal 0. Um, right there, we don't have any n's on this one. That goes to 1 over 2 times infinity, which equals 0. So this section right here is going to equal 0. And on this last section, we have an n, 6 times infinity squared. That one's going to equal 0. Um, and so that part, this part, is 0 as well. Uh, the reason it's 0, just um, to sh it's a theoretical idea, but if you have a 1 on the top, and your denominator is approaching infinity, which is some huge number, then 1 divided by some huge number um, is just going to be really, really close to 0. Same with this one, 1 divided by 2 times infinity, 1 divided by 2 times some really, really huge number, that equals z that's going to be uh, approaching 0. It's, it's a limit idea. And then same one here. Uh, big number on the bottom, one on the top, that's just going to equal zero. So now that we got rid of our, we took care of our limits, what we're left with is one, or three minus one, uh, plus zero, so we don't need that, minus one third plus zero plus zero, so we don't need those. Three minus one minus one third, and that equals 5 thirds. So that 5 thirds represents both the integral and the area under the curve uh, from 1 to 2 of this function. So um, there's just some special definite integrals. Uh, they're pretty simple. If f is defined at x equals a, then the integral from a to a of the function equals zero. Um, pretty much what it's saying is that if you've got some point, some point on the graph a, then the area under that curve, um, a line doesn't have area because it's only one dimension, but it, so it's going to equal zero. Next one. If f is integ integrable on a to b, then the integral of b to a of that function equals negative times the integral from a to b of f of x dx. Uh, so here's just a quick example. Given that the integral from 0 to 3 of x plus 2 of dx equals 21 over 2, find the integral from 3 to 0 of x plus 2 over dx. So if you just check to see if check uh, whether or not it satisfies the conditions, um, let's see. So a and b, and so um, it says find 3 to 0. So this is b to a. So b to a of some function, and that's just going to equal the negative of if the function were from a to b. So this this right here is going to equal negative 21 over 2. Um, this one, additive interval property, if f is integrable on the closed interval as determined by a, b, and c, then uh, all it says is that this one plus this one equals the area of the whole thing. And final one, some properties of definite integrals. Uh, you can pull out constants like that, and this one you can add, you can just add up 